All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Commonwealth Mastermind. Uh, I think this is what our third one in our series here. And today we are with what I call the COVID conquerors. I must have gotten myself on a silly day. Uh, but we are three months into what's been really a very challenging time of the COVID piece, right? We're six months with the half May mark of the year. So I wanted to come out and talk to a couple of folks that are having phenomenal years uh, as we hit this halfway mark in the year and who have actually really done a lot of business through the COVID. So let me introduce your three panelists to you. I'm also gonna just let everybody know that's out there listening. Uh, you do have a chat box. So if you have any questions for the panelists, I am monitoring that. Just feel free to post in the chat box. And if it makes sense when we get to the end question and answering, I can pull people in for questions. But at this point, let's use that. And our focus today is going to be really talking about doing business. Are these three panelists are very, very strong. I just want to introduce you to everybody. I'll start with uh, Marianne Clancy. Marianne is out of the Wellesley office. She is the top agent out of the Wellesley office for 2019 and running there still for 2020. She, uh, 2019, did about 456,000 uh, in GCI and about 20 million in sales. Currently running 10 current listings at the moment on MLS, right? I'm sure there's a bunch that are about to hit there and, and five pending. So, and Marianne, you've been with the company a long time, right? Since 2007, yeah. Yeah, so that's a long time, right? That's a long <laughs> time, so. Uh, and our next panelist is Benna Rondini. Benna is out of the Chestnut Hill Newton office. She's actually also running number one for 2020. Uh, she closed about 275K in GCI last year. And this year is actually with her close and pendings already over that number. So she has already beaten last year's number on her 2020, given what we're going through with about uh, just over about 13 and a half million in sales and currently has two listings out there on the market. And Benna and I actually go back to when you were new. So is that five years now, Benna? Um, I started January, 2015. Yeah. So yep. five years ago, I met Benna as a brand new agent. She's been coaching and training ever since, right? And came at it strong yeah. with the rookie of the year the first year and then just kind of went crazy from there. Yeah, yeah. And Such our final point. panelist is Owen Toland. And Owen is, uh, Owen, sorry. Owen is uh, with the Belmont office. He works with the Toland team with uh, his partner, Carol. And they did about 17.2 million in 2019. And 2020, I'm having trouble compiling your numbers, but I know it's pretty, you're, you're running ahead of where you were last year, not for the whole year, but where you were at this point last year. And you've got currently six under contract and four current listings out there, right? Yep. And oh, and you came into Berkshire Hathaway Commonwealth through the Century 21, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been licensed? So I've been licensed since June of 2011. So, so nine years now. About nine years. All right. So we have a very esteemed panel here in front of you. They all bring uh, their unique talents to the table for you to help, you know, really enhance your business. Part of what we want to look at is if with, when we're at that halfway mark in the year is how do we set ourselves up for that strong end of year? So let me kick off. I just, I'm going to ask to start to ask them some questions. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in that chat box that you see down at the bottom. So let's start with uh, just a general question in terms of this COVID point, you know, from March when we went into the COVID market to now, you know, what, what do you think is working best for you in this market? So let's start from that. Like, because you're all doing a lot of business through COVID. What do you think has worked the best that you've incorporated into your business during this time? Well, I'll start. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, actually, I think probably really, I hate to be boring, but the same thing that's worked in the past. Um, but I think, I tried to think of what, what I would do, what I'm doing that's not even different, but what I think is important about what I always do during the COVID crisis. And I think one is being positive. I think positivity is very important. And the second is knowledge. And with positive, I mean, I've always been positive, but I think it's even more important now. People are afraid. People mm -hmm. are scared. They're depressed. The world is coming to an end. They see horrible things on the news. So even though I've always felt positivity is important, you know, there's just nothing, um, 
nothing positive about being negative. Uh, I mean, yeah. so there's no reason to be negative. I don't care what the situation is, you can always turn a positive into a negative. Uh, the other thing I think is knowledge. I think because people are so afraid, it's very important for you as the real estate professional to be extremely knowledgeable so they have a feeling of trust, mm -hmm. whether it's knowledge about the market, um, about what's going to happen, what the future is. I mean, no one, none of us know. I mean, right. half of us are going to be right and the other half of us is going to be wrong. Um, but I, I try to do a lot of um, research about um, what economists are saying. There's nothing better than pointing to a specific person instead of just saying, I think, because no one really cares what you think. Right. Um, and, and in part of the research, I've used Dar Dr. Lawrence Yoon, who is the chief economist for the National Association of Realtors. And if you look up some of the things that he's saying about COVID, um, about the economy, about real estate, about what's happening in the world today, he's got some very, very positive thoughts. And I think he's a good resource. He's not, I know he, you know, is the uh, chief economist for the NAR, but he's also pretty independent. He's a brilliant person, and I would look him up. I'd look up a lot of people on the internet and get information and try to pass it along that way. Yeah. Um, and you know, Owen, you've actually you've actually done a market update through Videolicious, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, just piggybacking off of Marianne, uh, same exact thing. I mean, you want to be knowledgeable. Um, about the market, about interest rates, anything that has to do with real estate, um, because you want to be that beacon of knowledge for the clients that, you know, are, have uncertainty. Uh, mm -hmm. When there's uncertainty, that's, that's when, uh, you know, people are going to take a step back, whether it's buyers or sellers. So you want to make sure there's at least some level of certainty for the buyers and sellers. Um, but yeah, the, the chief economist from NAR, I listened to that, that podcast, I think it was with Brian Buffini when the, when, uh, uh, this first came out. I think it was called "This Too Shall Pass." That was a fantastic podcast, and it and it kind of gave me a little sense and and uh, positivity of you know what's to come. It wasn't like the world is ending, and it was good because I could pass that knowledge on. You know, almost take it as my own, but say you know this is what this person's saying. Um, uh, it's not all bad. So I think I think uh, you know this, let's let's sit and and see how this goes. And with with this whole. Uh, coronavirus it was very everything was very fluid everything was changing week by week um, at one week everything would be great the next week something would happen the next week the rates would go down and then they go up and then they go down so it's very important to keep you know your finger on the pulse of the market and, and understand you know where it's going to go or at least try and anticipate it um, and it relay that information on to the, the the clients yeah. Oh, and I know you did that video, Licious with the market update. That was yeah. very good, by the way. If, you, if anybody hasn't seen that, you might want to go try to find that out there. But how did you get that out to your clients and, and out to folks so you can get some traction with that? Yeah. So the obviously the best way to do it is through the BHHS marketing resource. And I've been using that a lot. So sometimes I just send it out as the video itself. Sometimes I'll include it with the newsletter. Um, and I'll always put it on my social media. So LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Um, and it's, it gets, it gets good, you know, traction. I, every time I send one out, I get at least, you know, one or two phone calls. So it's, it's, it's very successful and it's, and it makes me, you know, seem knowledgeable, even though I'm taking this information and just passing it on. Yeah. And so Ben, on that kind of note of expertise and stuff, cause I know we've talked about this a lot, you know, it being a market expert in this market and being able mm -hmm. to be the voice of knowledge has been key, right? Through mm -hmm. all of this, how do you feel like you've kept yourself plugged into things and, communicating that to your clients because I know for you you don't necessarily love the technology platforms right so I don't love the technology platforms but I have gotten better I've had to and I think it's adapting um, and and like Owen was saying it's a super fluid situation I mean I have buyers you know when the active buyers who were ready to go when the market was plummeting you know I've got my guy who works at Fidelity and he's calling me he's like Benna 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 this is crazy. What are you seeing? I'm expecting a 20% discount out there. It's going to hit. This is going to, you know, and just staying, like Marianne said, steady, calm, you know, it, to some extent admitting that we're all in the same boat, that this is fluid. This is changing every second, but we can help them, you know, adapt and let's watch it. 
And he continues to call because then the market was back up, right? And he's like feeling more bullish. And so I'm taking them out this weekend. He's back in um, because, you know, we're not seeing prices plummet at all, right? Inventory is, you know, tremendously low. Um, but people are home and they're interested in talking about real estate. So even what I call my very long-term clients who might buy tomorrow, might not buy for a few years. I keep, I have a lot of people like that in my sphere. Um, they're calling and they're pinging and they're asking about properties that I never would have thought they were asking about and they want to hear what's going on. So a lot of it has really been the slow and steady day-to-day -day communication and, and being the expert. Yeah. So keeping them informed is key keeping yourself informed so that you can give them the information, right? Being that expert that they can turn to so that there's some comfort. I mean, I know we've been talking a lot about, I think the day of the discount brokerage is actually, is going to take a big hit because that, that, that doesn't work, right? It wasn't working anyway, but it really doesn't work in this market because people don't have that knowledge. So if we jump over to like the, on the buy side first, because I know you guys do a lot with listings and stuff too, but on the buy side, you're talking about how competitive this is. You know, we've got ridiculously low rates right now. We're hearing 3% lower. Um, and the, we're hearing multiple offers on so many properties. How are you strategically winning and putting so many things under contract on the buy side? Oh, and you want to start this one? Sure. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm lucky because I'm working with a lot of young buyers. Um, mm -hmm. And when this first happened, um, when, when coronavirus was, was really uh, ramping up in the U.S., uh, you know, the young buyers weren't afraid to go out and look at houses, uh, whereas maybe the older buyers would were a little more cautious. So I was lucky in, in that sense. Um, I'm 29, so a lot of first-time home buyers. Uh, but now it's, you know, there's, there's more, a little more certainty. People are out there, so you have to get creative with offers. Um, we've been doing a lot of pre-offer home inspections, if possible, um, to try and, you know, drop the contingency for a home inspection, do it ahead of time. Um, I've, I did that on a multifamily in, in Watertown re recently, and we still didn't get it. Um, but, you know, you have to be uh, really creative with the offers in order to, in order to uh, you know, have a chance. I, I mean, there's, there's some times where there's 20 offers like I had in Weymouth, and there's, there's no chance. I mean, you, it's very, very <laughs> slim. You just, do they want to pay? Do they want to pay for it? That's pretty much what you got to ask them. Uh, but it's you just have to think of different ways. Um, maybe you can uh, speak with the lender and see if they can give you uh, a really strong pre-approval or pre-qualification. And uh, maybe they can say, okay, you know, we're confident with the loan. We'll we'll drop the we, you can drop the mortgage contingency. Again, this is something you need to consult with the the, the mortgage uh, professional. But um, it, it's important to be creative. Yeah, and then we've got the, a lot of them have those pre-underwritten programs, right? So you can try to put them exactly. in a better position too. Miriam, yep. I know you work with them heavily on the listing side, but even what do you see that wins in that multi-competitive situation? Um, <laughs> I don't do, we, I don't, not only do I mainly do listings, but I also am in an area, we don't have a lot of multiple offers, but, and this might sound like a silly thing, actually everything Owen said is absolutely correct and be prepared and pre-approved. I think probably if I had to pick the one thing that makes a difference is uh, to get along with the other broker. Be nice to the other broker. <laughs> Suck up to the other broker. There are so many people that come out and they're so obnoxious that I'm thinking, mm, gee, who do I want to you know, work with? And you know, you know they're going to be difficult through the whole process. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. Just, you know, and, and, you know, be honest, but at least try to get along and not be difficult to work with. Yeah. Communication's key, right? I'm always shocked when an agent calls and they're nasty right out of the gate. And I know. Want your offer to be accepted and you're going to be rude to me? I don't know how far that's going to get us, right? <laughs> yeah. Mar Mar Marianne, you're, you're so right with that. And like, it's, it's just a given for me. Like, I wouldn't even think about bringing that up, but you are so right. There's so many times where like, if I'm on the listing side and the buyer's agent, you know, is demanding or, or whatnot, like obviously if it's, if more, you know, no problem. Right. You know, my you favorite... be oh, and sorry. you're freezing a little bit, just so you know. Oh, and I think you froze on us. Uh, let me, let me jump over to Benna for a minute. Benna? Am I back? You're back. Yep. Yeah. You're back. You were, oh, nope. Yep. Okay. You're freezing a little bit. Um, ben, I know you, same thing, you've had some very competitive situations. You're also yep. doing a little bit of off-market stuff. What do you a think, what kind of advice market. can you give to clients? 
Yeah, well, it, I mean, just to, to the off market point, I mean, in my markets, we have tremendously low inventory. I know we've had it for a long time, but this has just made it worse. A lot of the sellers are freezing, not putting their homes on the market. They don't want people traipsing in and out of their homes. They have college kids home living with them, young adults living with them, and they just don't want to let people through. So a lot of prospecting that way for my buyers and trying to say, how about just one set of buyers through? Because they still want to sell. Um, so I've been working that a lot um, and, and, and had some success with, with some off-market deals and, and being aware of off-market deals, networking with other agents, because they do have non-MLS listings yeah. and quiet listings that, you know, they're not, you know, I'm not getting the emails on necessarily, right? They're not being widely broadcast, but you just, and that's back to Mary Ann's point about getting along with other agents mm -hmm. and building relationships and letting them know that you have a lot of buyers, qualified buyers, that you can get the deals closed. Um, so that that definitely you know goes goes a long way. But um, you know, I just had a recent uh, recent transaction where the house had been on the market about a month, which is a long time in sort of our market. Yeah. Um, and you know, we were one on one, so we started lower than list with like just a nice standard strong offer, um, and right away, right, what happens? it becomes a bidding war. You know, someone else who's been circling gets interested and it's psychological. Oh, well, if they want it, then I want it. Um, and my people, we, we talked it through when we're really able to step up back to interest rates. They listened. We looked at the rest of the market and how much, you know, they said, well, in a few months, we're going to have to spend a hundred grand more than this to get the house we want. So let's go up 40 on this one and just lock it up. So, um, you know, but that's been going on for a long time. I think all the things, the, the, pre-approval and selling anything you need to sell first and all that. Scarier to drop a mortgage right now, I think. Yeah. Have you, guys what... had, have you guys had trouble, uh, have you guys had trouble, you know, uh, you guys talked about how people thought they were going to get a discount in this market. So have you had trouble sort of communicating the reality to folks or getting them to believe you when you've had them out there? I think the proof's in the pudding. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. The data. You're out there and there are a lot of people, oh, we're going to get a good deal. That whole uh, philosophy, I think, lasted, you know, probably about a week. I think yeah. everyone, including agents, were stunned at how active the market was in light of COVID. I think the first week, maybe two weeks, um, everyone was a little oh. nervous about it. But quite honestly, that whole thing went away right away. I think people realize that. I have a few people that keep threatening the world's going to come to an end and the you know stock market's going to crash and we're going to be in a major recession and negative, negative, negative. Hmm. Um, but anyhow, and, and one other thing, speaking of negative and positive, this goes back to positive. Um, when you're, you're presenting an offer, and this goes for any time, don't tell the other agent how much they hate the house. And while that sounds silly, <laughs> you might think, well, of course I wouldn't do that. Do you know how many people present offers in a very negative, oh, you know, because they're thinking by saying negative things, you're going to convince them. Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's just so yeah. stupid. Yeah. And I, I say, well, you know, I, I want to find someone that's motivated to buy the house. Your people don't seem terribly motivated. Um, so just a little side Comment. Yeah, be careful, yeah. be careful. So not only have good communication, but be careful what you say, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah set, up, set up better. Yeah, go ahead, Owen. One more thing. Um, it's really important in a multiple offer situation to put, you know, to follow the offer instructions that the listing agent has. I'm sorry if I if I blanked out and, and someone already said this, but um, yeah, make sure if, it, if they want one PDF, make it one PDF, have the, you know, pre-approval, the, the check, everything. I know it sounds simple, but for, for newer agents, it's, and there's multiple offers, it's so much easier for the listing agent to go through and go bang, 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 and just see all the offers. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've been complimented uh, by listing agents saying like, you, you put a professional offer together yeah. and it really helped out. Uh, whether it won me the house or not, it, you know, it's still, it's still very important to make sure you present a professional offer and it, and it does go a long way. Make it, make it easy for that agent to work with all those offers, yeah, right? Absolutely. They're trying to they're trying to scramble with all of them. Have any of you, I know because we're seeing a little more of this because of how tough the market's been, a competitive, and because we're also seeing houses sort of come on, especially during the height of COVID, you know, the whole come on Wednesday, Thursday, open it up for weekends sort of went away because people were around during the week. Have any of you pushed the offers in terms of quicker deadlines and the offer deadline to see, you know, when you had a very strong client, see if you could beat out the competition that way? Anybody try that? 
I've tried it, I think, once, but um, they just, I, matter of fact, I know once during this time, and um, it didn't work uh, because they want, they insisted on waiting. And, and they knew I, what they had. They knew the commodity they had. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Because that, that happened to me in, uh, I think it was in Walpole. My, my buyer really wanted to put the offer in. It was a Friday. I think the deadline was, was like a Monday or Tuesday. We, we put the offer in. I hate doing it. Um, and it didn't work out. They didn't get the house either way. So. Yeah. And I haven't done it, but I, I know it's been done and has been successful. I've just heard from other agents, not widespread, but. Depends, I think it's depends worth on the property and motivation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially yeah. if you get somebody trying to get in another house and they're nervous, they just want to get the quickest contract. Yeah. Uh, somebody out in our uh, audience world is asking about, uh, or mentioning about personal letters too. Do you guys include personal letters? And do you think they get you traction? It, it depends on the seller. Yeah. If the seller's a family or if the, you know, sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, the seller is not occupying the home and there's no sentimental value. If there, if there seems like there's sentimental value, then it, you know, it can't hurt if the, if the buyer wants to do it. And I, during this time, um, again, it was another one-on-one -on -one, uh, offer situation, and we were just trying to get the price down. Um, and they had said, absolutely not, no more, you know, and uh, we stayed at our price, but we added a letter and just said, we understand you need more, want more, we respect it. If you change your mind, let us tell you a little bit about ourselves. And that was it. It was done. And yeah. it worked. That would work. Yeah. 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 I'm surprised. I honestly would have thought these would have been silly in the past, but I've been amazed at how it does work. People do notice, and it, I call them love letters, and, <laughs> and um, I send them with um, the offers. And and you know, I know from a, a listing standpoint, sellers amaze me. They do like them, but I will caution you as a buyer's agent to suggest that you read the letter over first. Yes, yes. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> I've actually had a seller tell me to tell the buyer to go. Mm. <laughs> okay, yeah. So yeah. I, good advice. As agents, we don't always worry about that, right? We just throw in the package and think, oh, it's good, it's personal. You yeah. might want to read it. <laughs> you would hope they wouldn't go there, but- the, You would hope, but you know. That, right, yeah. So let's, let's jump over to the listing side because you guys all deal with a lot of listings. Um, what, you know, and, and obviously things were very different three months ago, right? As we're starting to put stuff on. So what's different on your listing side, whether it's from the listing presentation piece to actually putting the market on the property on the market to letting people in, what's really the biggest differences that you see uh, over these last couple months, these last three months? Benna, do you want to start? Yeah. I'll start just, and I'll start at the very beginning, and then maybe you guys can like pick yeah. it up through the process. But if we start from a listing appointment, of course, people don't really want, most people really don't want you to come over and really haven't wanted that. So feel like, well, I'm close to wanting to sell, but you know, so I just, and again, probably a lot of people are doing this, but I just make them feel calm and confident and safe. You know, I speak to my own self and how I'm social distancing and how I am taking it very, very seriously, as is the entire company. Um, and I kind of walk them through that process, how I would show up with a mask and with gloves and with booties to the listing appointment mm -hmm. and we'll keep away from them. And I also suggest that I send all the documents electronically so I'm not handing them a CMA like I used to, which I do love paper, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but I've given that up to make them feel comfortable. I electronically send them the CMA before. And then I say, let's just show me around the house and then let's sit outside. So we've actually changed listing appointments by weather, but it's worked really well with several people, especially, well, I won't say, with many different people. People have young children, people are older, people are immunocompromised. So I go through the house pretty quickly, just take a quick look. And then we sit out on the deck or the patio, the season is cooperating. Um, and it's made people feel much more, you know, much more comfortable and it's been successful from the, again, that's just the first end. Have you done any Zoom listing presentations? I haven't. Yeah. No, I haven't. I haven't, you know, that's gone far enough. They've been okay with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, of course, I don't know, if, but Matterport has become, mm -hmm. I mean, a I used to. It's now a requirement. It's no longer an elective, right? I only, I mean, I had great photographers and great floor plan people, and I only was using it for higher end listings, but now it's across the board, and I get so much positive feedback. And if I may plug Miss Carrie Howells, yeah. I love her, right? 
She's there we go. We now have the Commonwealth Matterport piece, so that even when you get to the smaller uh, offerings, where some, where really actually it was a price issue, you know, it was too expensive on some of the smaller listings. Now you've got that package to go to, so that you can actually offer it on everything, and it has become critical. Anything yeah. else on the listing side, Marian, uh, on the presentation? Not really. I think you know, pretty much. I think Ben has handled it all. Uh, I haven't found um, it that difficult with my seller clients um I, and you know i think maybe the first you know couple of weeks but i think people are pretty calm about it now yeah but nothing really that so and then what about the listing itself and getting it out to market what strategies are you incorporating that might you know in general what do you incorporate because you guys do a lot of listings anyway but you know and what's different about covid what kind of things have you added on to get better traction from the typical you know have an open house and have 50 people tromp through because we know we haven't been able to do any of that. Oh, and you want to kick us off with that? Yeah. So, so obviously, you know, the Matterport is, is huge. It's, it's the next best thing to being at the property. Um, the quality is just so nice. And, and if you get a good person who does it well, they can, they can do a bunch of stops and it, and it's, it's really like being there. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it, it's, there's been changes. I mean, we have to, you know, uh, move with the changes with the open houses or the, you know, the, the limiting how many people can come in at a time um, and uh, having, having open houses, but by appointment only, that's, that's what we've been seeing a lot um, or just, you know, appointment only. And, and like we just listed a two family on Crescent Road in Belmont. So we're, we're the first floor is tenant occupied. We're, we're only going to do that for, for second showings. We're not even going to offer that. Um, but, but we're, we're doing a, we're doing an open house. We're just going to do, uh, pretty much appointment only and, and, uh, see how it goes and, and hopefully everyone cooperates and behaves and, and, and is respectful, uh, and, and is patient most importantly. So we're, I mean, we, we're always trying to cater for the, for the buyers, but it's, I feel like it, there's a lot of pressure now because, uh, people really want to get in the house and, and, and take a look, but sometimes there's a line, sometimes there's a lot of people and you kind of have to mediate that. Yeah. Marianne, you're running a lot of listings. How do you manage, manage yeah. 10 currently? How do you keep on top of all that? I am, I'm, I, I'm pretty organized. I have a helper and, um, you know, I have a great office where a lot of people are happy to do open houses, which by the way, I think on, on an aside, the open houses have been actually great. I've picked up more buyers myself. I don't usually pick, I probably picked up since COVID one, two, three three or four buyers uh, from open houses um, because I'm finding most of the buyers that are coming are coming either by themselves without an agent um, because no one was doing open houses. Mm -hmm. So other agents weren't picking these buyers up. So they were coming unrepresented or a lot of them are represented by Redfin and they're not really represented. Mm -hmm. They saw it in Redfin. They don't really have an agent. Yeah. So it's pretty easy to get a Redfin buyer. So actually it's been great that way. Um, I've tried to, at the beginning, it was great. As a matter of fact, I kind of wish COVID would happen all the time, not the illness. But <laughs> this is the best thing that's happened to me in real estate since I started. It's great. You know, the agent calls, they want to see the house. And I, you know, I, I have to qualify them. Are your buyers serious? Do they have the money? Are they pre-qualified? And it's kind of makes it, more of an important showing to everybody. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I, gee, I it can only do it Thursday at three COVID, you know, I mean, it's just been great in so many ways. No traffic. I love it. <laughs> that, that leads us, that's a good lead in to talk about sort of there's some good stuff that did come out of this, right. In terms of how you run your business and, you know, from what I've heard from some of the past panelists too, it's a little more control on your time in your business. Right, because there's a little less of that running around like crazy with people because you've got less tire kickers and stuff. So what a you know, she's Marianne's talking about the positive of really being um, there are no tire kickers, right? They're only serious buyers. The agents Pretty understand much. they have to make sure they let you know that they have to they have to be pre-approved. What other kind of positive things have you seen that came out of this that you hope stays in place? I hope that people uh, are serious that keep coming out. I'm noticing that there are starting to be people that are coming out um, and um, they they aren't as serious as they were. We're just starting to look. That's starting to happen again. And right. well, that's good too. I mean, you, you do want to have that. 
Um, but, um, you know, no, I think it's uh, mainly serious. Buyers. There aren't as many people coming out to open houses. And because I, I don't make an appointment at an open house, I have people stand in line outside one okay. group at a time. Okay. I go in, I turn on all the lights, um, open doors where necessary. Uh, let one family group or party go in at a time. And I, um, I don't make appointments because I find if, if you have 15 minute appointments and someone's 10 minutes late. It throws them off. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. And there's nothing better than people standing outside waiting in line. Yeah. It makes it look like, oh my God, I better buy this house because yeah. I'm going to lose out. So. Right. Well, and, that, yeah. and that's interesting for me. See, I'm learning on the panel because um, I've been doing all the appointments and I would say the only, not the only thing I miss, but one of the things has been picking up less buyers because I haven't been having true open houses. I've been having, and I have picked up some, which has been amazing. People who just do show up, even though they're supposed to have an appointment. And of course I just have them wait, bring them in and we have some great chats, but that's really, it's interesting to hear you say that Marianne, that you're having more success. Um, well, with Plus, I'm sorry to jump in again, but the other thing that you can do is people don't want to touch pens and things. So I always say, I'm going to sign you in. And mm -hmm. it's a lot harder for someone to lie when mm -hmm. they're looking you in the face. And yeah. you're down there. That's, a good, that's actually a good thing that'll come out of it, right? They can't scribble and, and, and just- I know, I may do that forever. Yeah. Yeah, yes. they can't make it unreadable. Oh, and how about on your side? Yeah, so uh, yeah, there's a few silver linings, um, just temporary. Uh, the no traffic is fantastic. I had a, a buyer seller in, in Norfolk, which is 45 minutes away with no traffic. And that would have, that would have sucked the soul out of me doing that going back and forth. So that was, that was really, you know, selfishly, that was great. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people are, if they're going to see the house, uh, like Marianne and, and Benna said, they're, they're usually serious buyers. Um, they've looked at the Matterport. Um, and so they know exactly what to look for. Um, we just, my seller, uh, in Belmont said she bought a house in Dedham and she knew exactly where everything was and, uh, because of the Matterport. So she was showing her family around, Oh, this is this, this is that. So it, you know, they, they're, if they're there, they're most likely serious. Um, and you know, everyone's most likely pre-approved. Um, a lot of agents are requiring a pre-approval letter ahead of the showings. Um, so that's, that's important to have. And it's, you know, hopefully that's, that's something we, we see a lot more of, so we don't waste anyone's time. Mm -hmm. So someone in, uh, out in the audience, again, had asked about the seller's disclosure form. If you're not doing the, a true open house, you know, with an open house tent type of format and you're meeting somebody new, are you sending that ahead of time electronically or are you doing in-person signing so they can pull up their phone and just sign it right there? I, I have them sign it there. That I do have them sign. And what I do is I keep a pen, I keep a little... Um, um, what is that stuff that you put on your hands? I should know. The, the, the uh, hand gel. The anti sanitizer. Sanitizer. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of, and I have a glove and I wipe the uh, pen off. They can see I put a couple of drops of the sanitizer, hand them the pen, and have them sign it there. Okay. Um, it's, you know, that's pretty yeah. easy. Yeah, and through Dot Loop, you can actually pull it up on yours and either have them do an electronic, like with a glove on or something, or they could pull it up on their phone then, you know, and sign it. If, you, if somebody didn't want to touch stuff. So that's like, that was a good question though about paperwork that you might have to deal with, right? So, so what about, you know, in general, like on, you're prospecting and filling the pipeline. We've heard a little bit of difference where, you know, Marianne's getting some folks off of open houses, Benny, you've seen a little difference in that because of the way yeah. our stuff's been running in, in the Needham market. But, you know, yeah. what, what, what changes and or how are you prospecting now to fill that pipeline? And I think for some of you, it's the same, but what's working best for you? Marianne, you want to start? I, I'm sorry, I someone came. Sorry, <laughs> My sorry. roofer was banging, I'm sorry. I'll, kick, I'll what, kick over to Owen first then. Yeah, what, yeah. What, what's working on the prospecting side, Owen, in terms of filling that pipeline and? Yeah, so um, I mean, it's again, it's, uh, social media has been great um, because I've been, I've been putting my uh, my monthly, I've, I've been doing it monthly, my monthly market updates on my personal or sharing it to my personal Facebook. And again, I'm in the age group where there's, there's tons of first time home buyers. The interest rates are so low. Uh, there's almost a mass exodus out of Boston because 
Uh, a lot of companies are, are permanently working from home or indefinitely working from home. So I'm getting a lot of people, you know, friends my age that I haven't talked to in, in a few years, reach out and say, oh, I'm thinking about buying a house. You know, how do I go about it? So social media has been, been pretty effective for me. Um, and again, just continuing to update my sphere um, and sending out, you know, a couple, uh, a couple emails here and there. Uh, a couple times a week. So it's, 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 it's been helpful doing it that way. And again, being informed is, is super important to, to let your first time buyers know, you know, yeah. what the pushing, is. pushing out that information we see not out of our company, of course, but out of some companies, people just post hey Hey, come work with me. Come work with me. It's like, you know, so what, who wants to do that? Right. But yeah. letting them know that, you know, what's going on and plugging them in. Ben, yeah. How about you from the prospecting side? I mean, it really is a lot of the same, which is, you know, for me, Owen's got the social media. We know that's not my strength at mm -hmm. all. Um, I'm working on it, but it is just keeping those relationships and my sphere and touching base and, you know, talking and, and even, um, you know, I've had a couple of instances recently, which is interesting. Um, and it's all been above board, but, you know, people who I met on the opposite side of transaction years ago, you know, so they were represented by someone else and they're ready and they're calling me just because, I don't know. I mean, it's so, so a lot of that has been, um, has been positive. And uh, again, just following up for me, you know, my daughter's graduating my oldest high school. So connecting with a lot of the people where they're youngest, it's their youngest graduating, mm -hmm. um, empty nesters starting. And so, you know, focusing on some of those people. Um, but it's, it's really the same. Oh, and through prospecting, looking for things for my buyers obviously leads to having discussions about selling um, and listing if it's not a fit for my buyers. So a lot of conversations, a lot of networking with my, people when you can. Yeah. Sometimes a lot, a lot more picking up the phone now, right? Because you can't meet, you don't, you don't see anybody at the restaurant. Right. A lot of just like texts to, to shoot it off and then giving a call and follow up and, and yeah. people do tend to have the time. You know, there's more of those conversations, and and you know, I'm it's it's the soft sell, the rela more the relationship management. Yeah, and it does work. That's, that's I've been a up for it, right? People actually <laughs> have the time to talk. Go ahead, Marianne. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was someone was coming in now. I know. It's a little um, trick when they're banging on your head, right? I know. <laughs> it's weird, but anyhow, um, I think actually during this time, it's been easier because it's much easier to reach people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it used to be that, you know, texts, emails, and no one really pays attention, but I've, uh, I've been doing a lot of calling and um, I happen to have a, a, a second house out in the western part of the state and it's an hour and 20 minutes. So I use to go and to come back and I sometimes go a couple of times a week. So that's two hours and 40 minutes of driving time. I'm on the phone the minute I leave mm -hmm. to the minute I get back communicating. I use that time. Now, if you're not going to be in the car for that long, I'm sure there's other ways that you can find, but it's nice to have a designated amount of time that happens to work because I can't do anything else to just call people, you know, oh, I was enough. Of course, I lie. I was driving by your house. I was thinking about you. How are you doing? I, as I'm on the mass bike in Amherst. <laughs> uh, and, um, but, but the biggest thing is being able to reach people. I've never had so much luck reaching oh, yeah. people my entire life. So now I'm going to ask you, uh, someone did ask Owen, what else types of things you're sending an email? Yeah. Um, so doing market updates. Is there anything else that you're sending out through the emails? Yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty, I'm only using the BHHS resource when I send out emails to my sphere. Um, and I'll, sometimes I'll send a coming soon listing, even though they're, they're not a buyer, you know, just to show that I'm doing business because business drives business. They see that you're doing well. They, you know, they want to work with you. Um, so I'm sending out coming soons. I'm, I'm, com I'm sending out just solds. Um, the newsletter, like I mentioned, I'll, I'll even include, you know, um, previous emails, like a, like a coming soon in the newsletter in case they didn't see it before, or, you know, just bombard them with it. Um, I'll, I'll put the market update in there. Um, so there's, there's plenty of stuff to send. I mean, you can send, you know, July 4th is coming up. You can send that and, and you may get a, you know, someone says, Oh, thanks. You know, happy July 4th. Hope you're doing well. So it's as simple as that. Just keeping in communication with people is so key because you want to be, you want to be, you know, first person they think of when, uh, they're going to sell their house or buy a house because there's so many real estate agents out there 
and uh, they may, you know, forget about you if you lose contact. Mm -hmm. Good. So, and one of the things, one of the things we see out of this time, right, is that the profile of the buyers and the sellers is changing a little bit. Like we've talked about, they're available to have longer conversations because they're home. Um, you know, there's less people going to be traveling for over the holidays and stuff. What do you guys see in terms of differences going into the summer? And if any, what do you think, how do you think the market will be this summer? What difference do you, do you think we'll see? And what do you think you have to incorporate to accommodate the summer market? I think it's going to be busy, hmm. really, really busy. And um, I had someone say to me something about the 4th of July holiday um, and, you know, slowing things down or whatever. I said, I just, I mean, maybe a little bit, but I really just don't think so. I think there's such a need and such pent up demand. And I'm hoping some pent up listings. Uh -huh. I'm hoping um, that I think it's going to just be very, very busy. Yeah. What do you think, Marianne, in your market? Um, oh, I think there's going to be a lot of new inventory, which is good and bad. I kind of, you know, the, one of the reasons that's driving this market is the low inventory. So I hope things come on slowly. We get three, if you get three, well, in my market, if you get three or four listings in one week, people are going to get comfortable and say, oh, I have time. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather have them come on uh, one at a time. Uh, but I think this going to be one of the things. I think that the summer market, and I've seen this a little bit in the spring, you know, up until now. Um, I think we're going to have more activity during weekdays. I don't know if you've all noticed that, but people, it's much easier and much more fun to go look at a house when you're working from home <laughs> and your boss doesn't know you're out looking for a house than it is to go out on the weekends when you can have that time to yourself. Yeah. And so I'm finding I'm doing a lot more showings during the week. And I know that's why, you know, take time off from work. No one's going to know. Well, it's easier for people to get there, right? They don't have to. Oh, yeah. Leave I mean, the other and they're probably closer to where they want to be, right? Right. Right. Well, yeah. And also, yeah, that's part of it. But also, you yeah. know, it, you know, I think the weekends are going to be slower than we, you know, in the summer. But maybe I'm yeah. wrong. We'll see. That would be okay. Yeah, yeah it would be fine. I love it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think this summer is going to bring? Yeah, I think I think it's going to going to be busy, um, a lot busier than previous summers, just because there was some point where uh, there was just no listings coming on in, in mid March, late March, um, just because of the uncertainty. So I think there's a little bit of pent up inventory that, that will come on. Um, in in my market, it's Belmont Watertown. It's I've I've talked to a few people and they they almost feel like the market's a little bit inflated and I, I maybe some people won't agree with me but it there's certainly some listings that are staying on longer than normal and with low inventory that's a little surprising mm -hmm. uh, maybe the buyers are just not willing to to pay that uh, belmont's taxes went way up so maybe that's that's keeping the home prices down um it's it's hard to say but um uh, some of the properties are surprisingly staying on longer than normal um uh but in I've had the first time home buyers that are looking in the 400 to 600 range. It's just, it's through the roof is there's 10, 20 offers. Like I said, in, in Weymouth, I had 22, there was 22 offers. Um, so it's just, it's the first time home buyers are really out there looking because they, they're not, they don't want to pay 3000 a month for rent in, in South Boston anymore when they're not working and, you know, not heading into the Prudential or, or the John Hancock or wherever they're working. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's really tough, those markets for buyers. And I feel bad for, for those buyers. Mm. Well, so you, you actually just brought in another point I wanted to mention too, is sort of the shifting of the market and the migration, right? We're seeing, uh, for those of you that are working a little closer to the city, we are seeing some migration out of the city and, and people saying, well, I'm not going to get the benefit of the city, right? I might as well go out to the country and a little more importance on the home itself and the features mm -hmm. of the house, right? Have you seen a difference of decks, yards? home office, right? The things pool, that people probably pool. wouldn't have been, huh? Pools. Pools, yeah. <laughs> and, and home gyms. Yeah. Are through the roof. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know you have a renter banner that came out from Boston, right? Out towards Needham, just saying, yeah. why pay Boston prices? It was interesting, yeah. He, so I have a, a one bedroom rental in downtown Boston that I can't move. I, mm -hmm. It's anyway, very- And it's adorable, it's a great unit. Yeah. And it's great and it's a great value, but it's downtown Boston in a building and I get it. Meanwhile, I rent my Needham, my Needham rental is a single young professional male who has been renting right next to my downtown Boston building, who's like, I'm paying less money 
in Needham for more space. I'm going to be working from home permanently. So the, you know, the, ad, the advantage of living close to my office doesn't matter. And he's like, even as bars and restaurants and everything reopen, they're not reopening in the same way for a long time. He doesn't see his nightlife the same. Um, so he's like, I'm going to save a ton of money, have a lot of space for my dogs and I, and, uh, you know, ride it out in the burbs. So it's interesting. Mm. Yeah. Marianne, how about out where, out where you are in the market? Yeah, we're definitely the burbs. That's for sure. <laughs> you definitely um, have yards and, and uh, oh, yeah. land right. and space, right? Right, right. We have plenty of space, plenty yeah. of room. Absolutely, people are looking for office space. Um, we people, I mean, for houses that have office space, yards, they want all the conveniences pulled. Ben is right on. I'm getting a lot of, I mean, I, that people always say, can I put a poll in? And they never mm -hmm. do. It's just a question. But I think a lot of people are serious about it now. Um, so we're getting a lot of people moving out. And, and I was a little surprised about that. I'm also seeing, and, and oh, and I wanted to ask you actually, because you said that some things aren't going that you thought would be going. Is that a higher price point? Is it, does it have to do with price point or is it just the last couple of weeks? And the reason why I ask that is the last couple of weeks, I've noticed things have slowed down and I don't know if it's because, you know, it usually does the end of school and even though it's online. Yeah, so I'd say the last couple of weeks because yeah. um, okay. this, I was talking with uh, Nancy in my office, Nancy Grignon and Dave Pearlie and, and they said, you know, they've noticed the $3 million listings in Belmont were, were going, but the under a million dollar listings weren't going. They had one on Dean street, a single family, very, you know, lots of space. It needed some updating, but fantastic location. And they had trouble selling it. Um, and that just kind of shows, you know, I think the, the market maybe at least in Belmont Watertown might be a little bit inflated. Um, or maybe the, the buyers don't see uh, Belmont or Watertown uh, the value of it since, the reason why it's so valuable is one because of the schools, but two because of the proximity to Cambridge and Boston. So maybe maybe the value has decreased a little bit in their eyes. Yeah. But it's hard, you know, time will tell. The schools have always propped up Belmont, um, so I think uh, I think you know we'll continue to see that. I think maybe it's just a blip in the radar. Yeah, I know for you guys, you're more a little closer to Boston. I know uh, Marion's out a little bit, but as you head out towards Metro West and further out, and even actually up into the New Hampshire border. It's ridiculous. It's it's crazy. And you've got those, you know, I think Owen mentioned just too, the first time home buyers are out there in groves with low interest rates and they're competing for the same houses. And so some of those are going over. But price is a sensitivity, right? If it's not priced right, the market seems to flush that out pretty fast and reacts to that appropriately. Yeah. So yeah, the buyers aren't just letting anything. I mean, we're still seeing multiple offers and and again, very low inventory in certain pockets, hmm. but they're they're still picky. They're still, they're not just saying, well, and that's something to talk to sellers about, yeah. that you still need to price it right. It doesn't, you always need to price it right. And um, yeah, we are seeing, um, I've had some surprises on inspections where people weren't going to nickel and dime and then they went ahead and did it after a bidding war. And I was like, okay, you know how many offer, you know, so it, it's still important. Mm -hmm. It always will be, no matter well, what. To add to that, it's the buyers, um, you know, what they want and what they need has changed because of this. So I think they, maybe they're coming from one place that didn't have, you know, a home office or, or a pool and they're, you know, they're adamant that they need that. So that, that could be a reason why. Sure. Yeah. Different, different priorities, right? Different priorities, focus on, on space, focus on location for things, right? Ability to get out. Like you said, the buildings, we're seeing some struggle in some of the buildings because, that was difficult when people had to try to get out an elevator and there's 50 other people trying to use the elevator, right? That, that caused some issues during COVID. So, yeah. All right. So now I'm going to ask you to share a secret with everybody. What, what, what little tidbit of your business do you think is successful that you could share with folks? Um, something that you've used, whether it's just even the, just this year or in the past or consistently that you think keeps your business rolling. I know they're all looking at their list because I'm surprising them with a new question. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll surprise you more by going first. There you go. Um, <laughs> I love that, Benna, see? But, but I don't think this is really, this is just something that I always have to remind yeah. myself. So I don't know that it's a secret and it's certainly not unique to this time because like Marianne started with, it's the same business. Some of the tactics we need to use are changing. But um, it, it just never fails to amaze me that when I am following up with a prospect, gently, but again and again and again, and I don't hear anything. 
for so long and I've kind of written them off uh, in my mind, but I keep every few months dropping something, a note, whatever, that all of a sudden they come out of the woodwork mm -hmm. and tell me, oh, I've been reading everything you sent. I've been listening to every voicemail, reading every text, always knew I'd call you when I was ready to call you. And that is something I need to remind myself in order to keep myself going. Because yeah. I'm like, really? How can they not even say hi? How can they after the, and it doesn't mean a certain number of them are going to call back anyway, at some point. You just don't know what day, what year. So don't, don't assume they're ghosting you. They're not, they're, they're yeah. just busy with their lives, right? Yeah. Some, some, yeah. And some, yeah. And some are ghosting me, by the way. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, but until they tell you to go away, right? There's no harm That's in right. keeping that following up going so you make sure you don't lose those people. Right. That are, they're going to pop up all of a sudden and, and move forward yep. with something quickly. Yep. Excellent yep. advice. Yep. Owen, how about on your side? Yeah, um, not just not just for during coronavirus, but in general. The, the fortune is in the follow-up. So like Dennis said, you need, to, you need to follow up whether they're responding or not. Uh, one of my favorite stories, this was um, pre-coronavirus, I was telling... Uh, our office manager, Ed. Um, I was driving through Belmont Center one day and I saw some guy I, I recognized and I pulled over and, and asked if he was looking to buy a two family. He said he wasn't because uh, I just listed a two family. He said he wasn't, but he was looking for a commercial property. So I said, all right, I'll keep you in mind. And you know, two, months, two weeks later, a commercial property came up and it was exactly what he wanted. And I called him immediately and, and you know, lo and behold, he bought it and, and it turned into more business. So um, it's always, you know, you want to put yourself out there. I mean, it, I know it's hard for some people, it's hard for me, but, um, I think that's the most important thing to do is whether it's either it's by email, phone call, text, it's important to remind people that, you know, you're open for business. Yeah. So I'm going to highlight that Owen, because as a coach, I'm in training. I'm always telling people, don't be afraid to stop and have a conversation with people. I heard yeah. you just kind of say, I saw somebody walking and had a conversation, like trust your gut, like your gut said, mm -hmm. Hey, Talk to this guy and see what's going on. You never know where that opportunity is going to come from. And it might not be direct. In this case, it was, right? Exactly. And then just, and then just picking up that extra person. Excellent. Mary Ann. <laughs> my, my roofer just came up. The street. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I can't do this. Um, in any case, um, you know, and I've never told this to anyone. So this is never in my whole, uh, all the years I've been in real estate. Um, I think my secret is actually the secret. I don't know if anyone's ever read the book, The Secret. Um, I love that book. I am a very positive thinker. I feel it. I believe it. Um, there is, I can't make it up. Um, and I think that's, I'm, I'm always positive. My cup is always half full. I can see the crummiest house and I can, and, and I will always think of the best part of it. And I kind of, you know, you hear of method actors. I think I'm a method realtor. I, you know, some people go with scripts. Some people, you know, do that kind of thing. I can't, I have to ad lib, which is why I say stupid things sometimes. But anyhow, I, um, I tried by doing that and really feeling it. Um, I, I think I bond with a lot of people. And um, I think that's what's helped me in my business. Positive thinking. And I know I had, I worked for a woman one time uh, who said, you read The Secret? And I said, no, she says, that's you. Everything else, that's you. Um, and I think, you know, that's what's, uh, that's my secret. That's a great book. Victor, Victor agrees with you. He loves that book. And there's a book that I've often used in the training classes we've done over the years. Ben actually might have had a copy of this. Feel Free to Prosper. Feel Free to Prosper is on that same philosophy, too, about really just setting up that intention, right? And just believing that's what's going to happen, so. Right. Good. Any, any last minute words for all these wonderful folks that have taken an hour out of their days to come hear your, your uh, sage advice? Yeah. I mean, I, I always like to say there's no substitute for hard work. I know it's super cliche, but um, there's so many agents that, you know, won't respond to emails for, you know, a couple hours. Like I'm always on my email. Like you don't have to respond right away, but at least, you know, look like you're, you're trying. And uh, you know, it's, it's important to, to you know put the effort out there because it's gonna you know it will always return i know we're in a commission-based business but you know the effort that you put out does does come back yep Bella? oh yes i know um, <laughs> almost done no i'm kidding i've loved this this is fun ah. um oh gosh yeah i mean persistence 
Persistence and hard work. People do think that um, I thought it. I thought it. My plan as a realtor, just so everyone knows, when I started, was I was going to sell two or three one million dollar houses a year. That you know, I just thought I, I literally believed I could do it that way. And then you know, lots of time off and all this stuff, and it couldn't have been more wrong. You know, right away got things rolling. But the hard work that it really, really takes. Um, I work. I mean, you know. I may be wearing shorts some of the time, right? But I literally put in many, many more than 40 hours a week. Um, and I love it. I mean, I love the job, but it does take a lot of time mm -hmm. to be successful. It yeah. really, really does. And, and some of the, it's a marathon. You know, some of the transactions, you're really making negative money with all the work you put in. Mm -hmm. And then you do get a few that go smoothly and it makes it all worthwhile. So, oh, yep. yeah, yeah. And Marianne? Well, I, I agree with the work part. Um, I probably have been guilty of, of spending too much of my life, I mean, I, uh, uh, working. And so don't, don't forget to save some of your life for enjoyment. Um, but I, um, I never say no, never. <laughs> And, you, and you, one should, I think, sometimes. I may be too much that way. But I think it's also important to um, particularly if you have a high level of business or you want to, you have to have systems in place. I am never, when I have an open house, I have an open house box. When I have go out to show a house, I have all my listings in my car in a file. Um, I'm a big systems person. I think I'm a very organized person because you have no opportunity to be organized in real estate. You can plan on doing the grocery shopping at 10 in the morning and you may not get there till seven at night. So if you're not organized in your business life, um, you have no control of your private life. So you really are gonna be a mess. So I would say keep some systems in place and be organized. Well guys, you heard it here, right? This is, uh, this is hard work, but if you put the time and energy in, you can do very well in this business. Um, hopefully you got a lot of really good advice today from our esteemed panel of COVID conquerors, right? Forge forward. I'm going to respect their time today because they've all got very, very busy set schedules, but really appreciate the input. I think there was lots of great pointers for everybody out there today. Um, we did record this so that it will be available 